Very good. So we should uh, we should start. So uh, here's what uh, uh, what we should do today. So I would like to take the uh, to define first uh, tunnel, which is a move for uh, for the higher SL2. So we work for the higher SL2 over SLL. So what this is, it's a pyramid like this with N vertices at the bottom and a vertex at the top, which we'll call zero. So uh, remember that for, SL, for the usual SL2, we had zero, one, and two. And our convention was the following. We had here some uh, K here L blades. These are multiplicities. Here we had N, which was equal to K plus L. So this is uh, the representation sigma N of... Uh, uh, S of the usual SL2, uh, this vector is E1 to the uh, power, let's say, uh, E1 to the power K, uh, E tens E2 to the power L. Yes, so this is how it's represented. Remember that what we did was we took here N points at the bottom, right? This was the, so this is spin for physicists N over two. Yes, so N is a degree. We took a point with multiplicity N. Yes, this was interpreted as the, uh, uh, as the young, Young diagram with n dots, and uh, then it was uh, growing. If you want, it was growing into uh, into these blades. Yes, uh, K and or L. Yes, uh, dividing into, and uh, the uh, operator E one two. It goes into some coefficient, which we normalize in different ways, um, times E1 to the K plus 1, E2 to the power L minus 1. Yes, that's the, that's the operator E1, 2. So it changes an E2 into an E1. Yes, and... Uh, Okay, so this is, uh, so what it does uh, uh, graphically is that it, it takes, uh, it takes uh, one blade like this and it maps it into one blade like that. So this is E2 and this one is E1. Yes, so it bends, so it's a, uh, it's a tunnel, so which we're going to represent as here plus and here minus. And that's what the operator does. So it increases the left and it decreases the, the right. 
the right, it keeps n the same. So this is again e uh, e one two. Yes, the operator e one two. So it moves this. Now, uh, uh, the question is uh, exactly what would be the generalization of this. And uh, you see the next one is a pyramid like, like this one. Yes, and uh, you can grow, you can have in the bases any of these three blades that's intertwined on the base. And so here, this is the intertwiner on the base, a typical intertwiner. This is, these are multiplicities now. Let's call them A, A, B, C. So these are now the vertices one, two, three, and this is zero. And uh, these would be A, let's keep the notation simple, A, B, C. Yes, these are multiplicities. So the bottom is an uh, intertwiner. One, two, three, and you have multiplicities here. A, B, C. These are multiplicities. And and the numbers here are A plus B, B plus C, and C plus A. Let's call it A plus C now. We're going to keep, yes, so these are the, these are the degrees of the representations. The degrees. of E reps on faces. So uh, now each, uh, each of the uh, blades can uh, grow into, uh, so a blade like this can grow either into a, remember we have studied the blades, so a blade like this grows either into a triangle or into a square on the other side. Yes, so now, the uh, triangle is a degenerate blade, so these are all degenerate blades, blades with given uh, boundary at the bottom, yes, at the base. Right, the multiplicities are A, B, C. So each of them can go into one or the other. And uh, let's see what this does. So this one would be one, the, the blade at the bottom is, uh, is uh, one. So this is a blade, let's call it in this case one and two, three. So this is a partition, partition ordered. Uh, no, it's not at this point. So it's a partition, because it's a blade, blades are not ordered. Partition of, uh, of uh, um, coordinates, labels, into two parts. The partition is non-trivial, two parts, non-empty. Uh, 
exactly like the one and two, three, yes? So this is, do you see here you have one and here you have two, three. These are lumped. Yes, they're grouped together. This part clear, so this comes really out of, uh, of a single one-dimensional blade, which we're going to put like this. This is a coordinate one, and these are the coordinates two, three. In the language of trees, this blade is one, and is simply one. It's made of two trees, which are one and two, three. Uh, there's no room here for anything else in, in this. So the way it grows is the following. This triangle, you see, is, so the triangle is, uh, is now a uh, similar separation, but in one more coordinate. So this one is one, two, three, and zero. So this one is, uh, is uh, one and zero, two, three. So zero is with a two, three, yes? And the other one, which is the, uh, the square, is uh, as you can see this one is zero one and two three zero one and two three so it means that uh, the way to grow it is so uh, put put in turn zero in each of the parts. Yes, so you have the two parts, uh, one and two, three. Here we put zero on the side of two, three, yes. You see zero, two, three here. And here we put zero on the side of one, yes? Out of the base, which was uh, this, this one. Yes, so this is how a blade grows in a, a two by two simplex. Uh, you take the uh, top coordinate and you add it to either of the parts. Please, if you have any questions, uh, ask uh, if you want any further discussion. So uh, and now we want to, uh, uh, to build a tunnel. So you see, well, I'll, I could show you, maybe I'll show you some other time how I found the tunnels. Basically, you take uh, one, uh, uh, one way of uh, growing uh, the blade, this blade, and the other, and you take their difference, yes? Right? So if you have this blade at the bottom, which is an intertwiner, uh, it can grow one way or the other, so the difference exactly with the same, uh, uh, same kind of uh, graphics that we used in the in the uh, two-dimensional case. So this is, by the way, this would be SL2 over SL3. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the high SL2, one higher. Yes, it happens in its blades in this pyramid. And as we'll show, uh, this uh, this gives you precise. This describes precisely these uh, intertwiners, which are fundamental in chemistry and physics, the Krebs-Gordon coefficients. So, 
uh, we uh, we uh, have here again the uh, red and the blue blades. So you see here, this blade grows like that, and we it continues degenerately, uh, or it grows the other way into a square. and then it continues up, yes. Um, by the way, there's a, uh, I found graphically a nice way to show this, which is that uh, you can show, let's put it in the same, exactly the same position as above, so you can show here in a triangle the, uh, uh, you can cut, so you can take a section here. And what you're going to have is uh, a red one goes like this and the blue goes like that. Yes, so this encodes, so you see we're going to show them maybe this is this and this is that line, as you can see. Yes, and, uh, and in general you have, uh, you see the other ones. So this is, so these are multiplicities. So this is how you describe a section the blades which are inside inside the two by two pyramid. Yes? So they are on a three by three triangle. Yeah. So you have here do you see we, we have at the bottom an intertwiner, yes? And it can grow either through a red blade. So we look at what blades inside the pyramid have that intertwiner at the bottom. Yes, the given intertwiner, the given white intertwiner. We find that, for instance, if we have multiplicity one, it can go one way or the other. Graphically, what you do is you take a section here. You see somewhere halfway to, to the full height. Yes? And if you take this section, then the triangle would look like this line Yes, and the, uh, the square would look like this longer line. Yes? Just a cut. You see the triangle is this line intersected with a cut, yes, and the square is this other line. Uh, so if you want to... Uh, hmm? uh, so look, if you want a more exact uh, thing, we have it, and uh, here it is. Yeah. Uh, no, no, you don't go so high. You cut it halfway. It's just for graphical purposes. Uh, yeah, no, this is just a section for visualization. It has nothing to do with the structure of the blades themselves. Just a moment. Um, so you can see it here, for instance, at the top. Do you see? This is a pyramid. It's shown very lightly, the pyramid. Yes, we could uh, magnify it a bit. Let's see what uh, Mathematica does. Okay, and uh, here it is. Do you see, this is a pyramid here. Do you see the pyramid? Yes. And do you see here this uh, square? The way the bottom blade grows into this square, yes? And you see that it intersects. So this is exactly halfway to the first floor. 
Yes, and you see that halfway the square intersects on this blue line. Yeah? Uh, look at this square here. The, the uh, pyramid in which we're working is uh, two by two, but the section is at a fractional height. The section is just for visualization, it's not. Look if, uh, so the section is, is simply for visualization. It's a uh, SL2 exactly, which means size two of the pyramid. SL2 uh, over SL3. So this is SL2 one higher. Uh, two, the edge is two. The edge of this is two. So if you, the edge from here to here is two. Do you see this point is in the middle. We simply cut it halfway just to visualize the squares, it's very hard to see otherwise the squares. Do you see? So you have this line. This line can grow either in a triangle. Can you see the triangle here? Yes? And this triangle intersects this section. So the section is at height one half. Yeah? It's just for visualization purposes. It's a height one half. Yes? Do you see? And then the triangle is intersects it by with this red line, yes? The square intersects it with this blue line, yes? So if you're given a, if you're given a multiplicity here, for instance, uh, this edge, which is, uh, I don't know, it has multiplicity, let's say five, then uh, you could, this could divide into triangles and squares, so it could have, uh, let's say, uh, two multiplicity, two here. Yeah, I, I'm going to do it right away. So two and uh, three. So we're going to turn on the light now, all the lights. You see this, uh, this edge at the bottom is dividing into two and three, yes? So you can go into a triangle or a square. Okay, so, uh, so we're going to start, we, we start with an intertwiner and we flip here one, let's say one square into one triangle, yes? So uh, if the coordinates here are, the names of coordinates are, let's say one, three, and two, then this operator, you see, is, uh, this here is five. So this is changing from, uh, two, three into one. So this would be something like E1, comma, two, three. Yes, so it changes from two, three, from the blue blade to the red blade, two, three into one, yes? So uh, this goes from the blade, which was, we said, uh, here zero, the tip was on one, so this is, uh, let's say zero one, zero one and two three, it moves it into a one and zero two three, to be precise. These are the names of the blades. Yes. So you basically, you have a, a blade like this. You can see in a in a uh, uh, in this pyramid. You can. I mean, you can visualize the triangles anyway. Yes, so this would be a triangle, and this is a square section, yes? Right, so every edge from the bottom can go either to the left or to the right. These are the analogs of E1 and E2. And you have this for every direction. 
uh, same in the higher case. So now uh, let's uh, now let us uh, take an. Uh, you see, by the way, what what is shown uh, here is, uh, is exactly the picture for the proof of the uh, Wigner three J coefficients. Yes, it's the uh, the expression there. So, uh, mm, just a bit, so we're going to mute it. And so, in general, we have some uh, operator E A A prime where A is a subset of one, two, three. These are coordinate labels. And uh, A prime is A complementary with respect to this. And uh, so this is an operator EAA A prime. And what we... Uh, in order to work with such operators, uh, the best way to do it is to take, so once again, this is in some higher thing. Here you saw the case when you have three, three numbers in the basis, yes? So this operator, E1 and two, three. So in general, you have this EA prime, and the best way to do it is just like here, you see? Here we took uh, for this operator, we took uh, sections, so let's see, on this, this is a section. So this is, uh, uh, let's say this is one, two, and uh, three. Yes, so this is a section, and on this section, we, we see it as a usual operator. The one in Gelfand Settling, yes? On the next section, uh, on this section, uh, we see it as nothing. So here there's uh, something, but if, since we neglect the horizontals, uh, there's nothing, basically. This is on the 2, 3, yes. And uh, on 1, 3 in the back, On one three, you will see it like this. Yes. So, so you see on two of the sections, you see it as a usual move. On the others not. You can see why you don't see on two three. This is because our operator was E1 and 2, 3. Yes? And uh, uh, similarly, I mean, you can see very easily that, uh, with some thought, that this is, uh, that if you have an operator EA, A prime, then you see it is, um, so if you take I to labels I and J, and you do a section which is zero I J, yes, one of these boundary sections, yes, just the two dimensional one. Then you're going to see it uh, if I is in A, uh, if I is in A and J is in A prime, then you see it as uh, E from I to J, from J to I, yes? So you see it uh, like this. E 
if i is in a prime, j is in a, we're going to see it as ejI goes from a prime to a, and if uh, i and j are in a, or i, j are both in a prime, then you see it as nothing, no move. Yes? So you have the sets of coordinates A and A prime, and you, if you have an I and J like this, then you see it as moving from J to I. Yes, and if both are in the same side, you don't see anything. Very good, so this is, uh, this is what we call a, a tunnel, so this is a tunnel for for uh, SL2 over SLN with underlying or, or uh, this is the underlying or subjacent as we called it. So this means uh, you are uh, N plus, N minus two higher than uh, the usual one, usual Gelfand settling. But that's not really the, I mean, the Gelfand settling has some other numbers. Um, so this is uh, my interpretation of the Gelfand settling, so with wires. Very good. Any questions? So At, at the bottom, well, n equals three. Yeah. Um, it's given by a morphism. It's the blade. Oh, at the bottom, no. The bottom, you see, in this case, that's a good question. So, so the bottom, it plays the same role as a node uh, n for us. You see, so. Uh, you see, in the usual case, you had n, this was a total degree, so as in sigma n, yes? And that n was dividing into E1 to the k and E2 to the L, so the total power is n. These are the representations of SL2, yes? So you see what you have at the bottom uh, tells you the representation, the irreducible representation. So now, uh, that's a nice part about the higher representations, that what you have at the bottom, you see are, are blades, so that's all we ask. Just linear combination of blades with, uh, with non-negative uh, uh, entries, I mean non-negative components on every shard, yes? So on every little piece, you should have something non-negative. So this is, remember, this is, I mean, if the base will be bigger, this will be described in terms of curvature. As, I mean, the fact that you have a height, which is a convex function. Yes, so, so this is very natural. And what you have at the basis is the irreducible representation. So you're given three numbers here, A, B, C. Do you see? Three numbers, A, B, C at the bottom here. Yes, then uh, the basis is exactly uh, a pyramid of this kind, yes? So it's a pyramid in which you have blades. So in that case, in this pyramid, in this, so, so the base is this, if, it's, if you go one more higher, one, one, so if we go two higher than usual, yes? Then the basis is a pyramid like this, yes? It has four triangles. Can you see one for every corner? And three uh, squares, one for every pair. Yes, uh, this is a square. So it has four squares and, uh, I mean, four triangles and three squares. Yes, uh, this is, the three squares come from dividing the coordinates one, two, three, four into 
a partition uh, uh, into two sets uh, with two elements each. The total number of blades here is seven, yes, which is exactly the uh, sterling, uh, sterling of the second kind of four, uh, of partition for partitioning four into two. So this is sterling four two. So it's a way of uh, of uh, uh, partitioning four coordinates into two non-trivial subsets. Yes, so we can take two and two, there are three of these, or one and three, there are four of these. When you add a pair, yeah. you No, no, no. Uh, no, 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 this, the curvature uh, does not appear here. What, the way the curvature appears, uh, well, let's forget the curvature. We'll put it at the end. That's just an interpretation. That's, that's my question. I, I need to ask that. Just when you cover the space, for the, yeah. I, for the SL4 case, when you curve the space, and then you get some cells as the parameter hedron. Uh, yeah, but in that, I mean, if you if you curve something smaller, yes, uh, you mean, uh, uh, should this have edge two or arbitrary edge? Arbitrary edge, but my question is. Yes. For the honeycomb lattice. Yeah. For the classical case, yeah. you can put the morphisms the generators right inside the honeycomb ah yes yes you this is that's a big process so you um, you uh, uh, take the geode so you first uh, put the potential you take the geode then you grow the geode height the same height yes then the points become eyes of the honeycomb and you fill them with permitohedra, yes? Yes, and then in the permitohedron, what do you feel in the permitohedron? Uh, the, these permitohedra have multiplicities on blades. Yes, so uh, I happen to have in advance of your question exactly a uh, nice network of permitohedra, yes, which plays exactly the same role that we uh, that was played uh, before. Yes, uh, exactly the same role that was played here. Uh, just one, one uh, second, let's find it. Oh, there are lots of uh, files. And uh, are there. So, uh, let's put the image mute or not so mute. Uh, there. This picture. Just yes. Here in the honeycomb, there. you put uh, the generators of those models. Exactly. So these generator, exactly. So do you see you have here, this is a generator. This is V to the wedge one. Remember, yes? This was V to the wedge one. This was V to the wedge two and V to the wedge one. And this is here, the, the thing at the node is a determinant, yes? So this is a big collection of determinants. That's how this, uh, this thing functions. Filled with determinants, you put something on the border and it computes a one, a negative one, or a zero. Yes, that's what this machinery does. And uh, now in the higher case, um, it's a bit uh, tricky, but what you can, what you do is you take, you see there are centers for these permitohedra. Yes, each of them has a center. And, uh, and then um, for two numbers in the centers, for instance here uh, a, a three and a five, the numbers here. Yes, you take their difference. So this is an oriented blade. You take their difference. And, uh, and uh, for that difference, so you put that difference on this blade in between. Yes? So you see every uh, face of the permitohedron uh, lies exactly between two of the neighboring, between two affine centers. Yes, so the square, for instance, is like a diagonal. Yes, 
So if you are around the point, and ah, here we have a nice point, yes? Do you see around this point, you have uh, four nice hexagons, one, two, three, four, yes? And two squares. Do you see one square, the other square? Now, dual to that, you have what's called a vial alcove, which is this one in yellow and blue. Do you see? So this is like a vial chamber cut with a fine lid. Yes, and you can see here, these edges, by the way, are oriented. Yes, and this describes for you the group Z mod 4, actually. So this, the yellow edges correspond to adding one. Yes, the blue edge is adding two. Yes, so this would be here, if you add two, do you see? So we get the circle here. Can you see the, the yellow circle? Yes. These are the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, mod 4. Yes, so the yellow ones add 1, and you see this gives you these hexagons, and the, uh, the blue ones add uh, 2. Now, if you have four numbers in the black points, yes, four numbers, then you take the difference. So the difference between one and the next, this would be on this hexagon. Yes? The difference, bet the diagonal difference, the difference between this and this would be on this square, a uh, multiplicity. And then what you find, do you see here, a square and two uh, faces make a letter Y. This is a feature of the affine fermitohedra, yes? And for each of them, the multiplicity is a difference, this minus this, this minus this, this minus this, mod n. Yes, so you take them positive. So, so you take three differences mod n, since the sum of those differences is zero, a minus b, b minus c, c minus a. Yes, then uh, the sum of them is zero, it means that the sum of them mod n, each of them mod n, is n or 2n. So it means that every three, uh, uh, three faces of the permitohedron meet exactly in a letter Y like there. Yes? So uh, you can have uh, uh, exactly, that's a beautiful part, so in the eyes of the hexagon, remember the eyes of the hexagon correspond to, uh, to uh, coordinates of the center, yes? And uh, do you see, so these are the points if you are in 3D, these are the points which blow up into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, the, uh, the permitohedron. So, uh, not the permitohedron, that uh, eye of the honeycomb, yes? Remember, the eye of the honeycomb, as I was saying, has not appeared in the mathematics or physics literature yet. So the picture itself is new, so nobody has, has seen it. Uh, but you see every edge here, so that, that uh, that object is dual, orthogonal dual to this. Yes, so every point, for instance, here, do you see it has uh, 12, uh, it has 12 green edges going, these are roots. So there are 12 roots of SL4, yes, you have diagonal elements, yes? So 12 uh, green, uh, uh, green, uh, uh, edges which would uh, open up into hexagons. So you'll have 12 hexagons. And you see there are here six uh, blue lines which will open up into, uh, into uh, uh, six uh, squares yes, because they are surrounded by, by uh, right angle triangles, yes? So uh, you can see it, you can see it here in Mathematica. Let's see, this should have something called uh, uh, interactive geode, yes? So here, we're going to answer your question right now. You see here, we give the coordinates of the shards in general, they were, I have them up to 
a very big number, eight coordinates, here is only four. This is three plus one dimensions. And uh, remember, so this is exactly the base. I mean, this is exactly, uh, uh, no, this is exactly the, uh, uh, this uh, figure, yes. So we have an intertwiner there, we put different blades, and with that, we're going to curve it. Now, let me, uh, I'm going to show it first in the case, in the smaller case, when uh, uh, the rank is uh, two, this would be mean SL2 over SL4. Exactly the one that we're looking now. Do you see, this is, this is a picture, yes? So this one, we'll have to explode it and uh, see how, uh, uh, how it blows apart. There's no point curvature because there's no inner point. But uh, if, it, uh, if it opens up, then we do the following. We bend it. Let me show it to you from the side. Do you see, this is a picture from the side. We are in 4D. Yes, we bend it, oh, let's see, this is a bend. You see, so this is a curvature, but I mean, there's no point inside, but it can still be bent. And then we lift, this is a geode. So we bend and then we lift, yes? And then we turn back into, we turn back our point of view, our camera. And here's what we get. So then we look only at the top. And at the top, what we get is, uh, is exactly this. So it's a box, do you see, with, uh, with uh, four prongs. Yes, so let's see here. Box with four prongs, uh, we can, uh, uh, bend it a bit more also, and then we make this smaller. Yes, so in the limit, it looks exactly like this, yes. So it's a rectangular box with four prongs, yes. So when you have the 6J symbol, uh, do you see, first of all here, there are exactly seven variables. I mean, three to describe the box. Here's the three dimensions of the box, yes and four prongs, four prong length, yes? And, uh, um, and uh, the, uh, the beautiful form of the uh, 6J symbol is the following. You take the sum, so 6J can be described in the following way it is equal to uh, the sum, uh, up to normalization, the sum of, with sine plus minus, of the total number of blades. So the number of blades equal to the number, equal to the, the uh, sum of the seven, one up to seven of this length the number of blades, the total number of blades plus one factorial divided by the product of the number of the multiplicity of each blade. Factorial. So it's a, uh, and they alternate because, so let me uh, uh, show you show them to you on the simplex here. Yes, there are seven blades, four of these. And, uh, and uh, uh, let me see which is the best one to visualize, uh, maybe. So we need a square, yes? So this could be a square. For instance, this edge can go up to here. So this is a square. So there are three of these. You see these blades, yes? And the three blades, do you see they expand the box in the three direction. 
Yes, so if you if I would put another blade, the box would be would grow by one in that direction. Yes? The triangles give the length of the prongs. Yes? You see, these are perpendicular to the prongs. So, so you see if we magnify this this is the uh, I, I'd say th this is probably the nicest visual part of the whole uh, of the whole uh, thing. Do you see? You can see them here exactly as they grow. Can you see? The triangles become the prongs, yes, and the squares. Do you see? The squares become exactly the width of the box, yes. And now the, there is a sum here. Why? Because uh, the four triangles uh, can be exchanged by the three uh, squares. Yes? Uh, all of them give outside on the boundary, they give exactly a one, one, one. Do you see? If you take all the triangles, you get on each face a one, one, one. Yes? So the famous, so there must be in the physics literature hundreds of papers on the 6J symbol. I remember when I came before the internet around in the 1980s, I was at Berkeley, and I looked for a book on 6J symbols. They didn't exist in electronic forms. So they existed in a book, like the old books of logarithms, and that was the most used book uh, in the library. It was black, and it missed corners. So I think all the chemists looked at this. So they really used them to calibrate their... Uh, I mean, they get, you get this way, okay, it's information on spins. You can measure only some spins, yes, before destroying it, in, as you know from information theory. And uh, the question is, if you measure something, what information do you get on the others? Yes, and that's contained in this 6J symbol. So, uh, that's, so this is a gauge, yes? This is what we call the gauge, which for us will mean freedom of choice, yes? So the gauge is exactly four triangles go into three squares, yes? And can you see, I don't think I programmed here the gauge. Um, there's just some tilt, no. Bend zero, maybe, no, no. Uh, so the gauge, you can see it here. What can happen is that the box can grow by one in each direction. Can you see? Remaining parallel to itself. Do you see the box can grow by one unit along each face, and then the prongs would get smaller by one. Yes? So this is a breathing. Yes? Breathing is you, you grow the box length by one, you diminish the, until you finish one of the prongs. Yes? or the other way until one of the dimensions of the box is zero, right? That's a, that's a breathing. And this is what's the sum. So this is uh, uh, called in, uh, in number theory uh, a terminated hypergeometric function. And uh, sometimes, I mean, I'm always looking whenever I, they put out a new book on hypergeometric function, but it's, it's considered a bit too difficult for the usual thing, so they kind of skip it, so. But it's uh, it's a beautiful function, and uh, so this is a this is a six J. And uh, uh, what about the breathing as curvature? Yes. So you see what you can do is just take here the top two. Yes. Do you see there's a point in the middle? Yes. A blue point in the middle. Yes. So if you give heights to this, the heights are toward the fourth dimension. You can lift this point or lower it while it's still convex. Yes, so you have a surface like this, you have a point, and you, you can lift it and lower it, yes? If it's too low, it won't be convex. If it's too high, then again, it won't be convex. Yes, so it has an interval. And this movement is exactly the breathing. That increases the box and decreases the... You can see, because this is really, it's a... Uh, Remember that if you look at it from the side, uh, which is uh, 
this view, I think, uh, let me see here, uh, are the projections. So if you look at it from the side, uh, if you add also the the border and if you no forget the border if you if you uh, bend it uh, less but you lift more or something then uh, let me see we should be able to see it uh, it's a little bit too uh, uh, so remember we bent it we are bending it uh, I think uh, we need to to run it again, as it got into. So we can look at it from the side, you remember like this, we bent it, yes, and uh, then we lifted it. And we saw the curvature and all this. Do you see the curvature? Uh, so there's a nice, uh, there is actually a curvature, yes. You see, we bend it, the curvature is a box. Can you see? So this is a geode. Its one dimension is compressed. Yes. So you bend it, and you 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 lift it more. Yes, like this. And now you can add also the others. You can add the blades and the simplices themselves. You see, you have a nice geode here, though it's a bit flattened. And now you turn it in 4D. And it gives you exactly this. Yes, this is our uh, our uh, box. Yes, so if we bend it a little, if we lift it a little bit more, then it's exactly that. Here you can see also the original base. Yeah. Which is what? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know exactly the computation. I haven't, uh, I'm still working on the computation, which is done in a, inside a two by two thing, but it's filled exactly with, uh, with these honeycombs. Yes, and we have multiplicity. So in principle, you can compute a determinant here on every edge. With this, with this, with the network of permitohida. Ah, but those zero one twos, the numbers. Yes, that was the uh, the rather surprising thing, in this case, exactly. Uh huh. But look, what are these zero one two? Do you see? Um, I must have gone uh, too fast over it last time. So, uh, uh, the edge there was four, it was four, I think, yes. So, okay, so this is the edge is four, you see like this. And this one has coordinates four zero 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 four zero and uh, zero zero four. Yes, and this one then, do you see here you get uh, one three zero. Yes, and if you move here this way, you're going to get uh, a uh, um, one two one. This is a coordinate of this point. No, 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 but that answers your question. You see the numbers that you put there are exactly the coordinate of the vertex which blew up. So since these are one to one, so this one would blow up exactly into a one here, a two, and a one. Yes, so the determinant, this means that you have a you work over SL4, yes, and this is a one form, a one form and a two form. And this gives you a determinant, yes? 
So it's a tensor, it's a tensor product of a one form, a one form, and a two form. Right. So if you go one, uh, if you'd go one higher, yes, then you'd have these numbers. Those numbers, yes. Right. Numbers with four coordinates, exactly. Yeah, the, the, uh, yes. So, um, you can have, you, you, uh, you can have the arrows, I mean, multiplicity, instead of multiplicity on lines there, you're going to have multiplicity on surfaces, which are surfaces like this. Yes? And you can get consistent multiplicities on surfaces exactly as we discussed. You put numbers in the middle of the, of each, uh, uh, of each, uh, so you put numbers uh, at the centers of every permitohedon, and you take differences, yes? And you see these, the, 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 the structure of these numbers, these, these differences, one, two, three, yes, four, these are exactly four numbers, and these should be the coordinates, so of the point. Yeah, these paves, so they, they absolutely, they fill the space, and you see the, the lines there. Do you see the lines which, as I said, you have regions which are, which are a, like a phase in, uh, in uh, physics, yes? They have exactly the same intertwine on the whole region, do you see? There. So, uh, so here you have also the whole intertwiner, for instance, in the box, and... Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, box itself, this is important, the box uses exactly these weights. So those weak, those lines there are exactly weights. They're in the direction of the weights of SL3. Remember, the weights are different from roots. So here, these are weights. You see, you see here the blue blue line here, yes, and you can see the orthogonal. Yes, so these, this is how you make the box. And the prongs are in the direction of the yellow lines, which are diagonals of a cube. So those vertices will become some vertices in the weight lattice, is that true? Uh, yes, the vertices are in the weight lattice, and it's a very interesting thing, which is, uh, well, we thought that it was known, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's proved fairly easily. It was not quite known. Uh, is that, uh, I think for, for SLN it should be known. Uh, in general, it's not. Uh, so the, the uh, statement is the following. You have the, uh, uh, for SLN, you have the weight lattice. Yes, so there's a lattice of weights. Do we have the weight lattice, William? No, no it's in the... So we have the weight lattice, which is in the office. And uh, the Voronoi neighborhood, so if you take, you see we are here uh, a number of people, if you cut the space, uh, so if you take for every person, who's, for every point, who's the closest, yes? You separate it into neighborhoods like that. Yes, so the Voronoi neighborhood of the weight lattice is exactly this, uh, this permitohedra. So these are in the middle, the centers of these are exactly the weights of, or the weight lattice of uh, SL4, yes? And you see here you have a shorter distance which is going through a hexagon and the longer one which goes through a square, yes? So you can see this magnified here. Do you see these are weights, the yellow and blue? As I was saying, these four are weights. They're exactly the weights of uh, the representation uh, of the four-dimensional representation. So this is SL4 acting on C4. So it has these yellow weights, yes? And the blue ones are the weights of uh, the, the two forms of SL4, like the ones which appear in the in the uh, electromagnetic tensor F. So, so uh, 
You see there are three uh, directions for the blue, and these are exactly uh, E1 with G2, E1 with G3. I mean, they are exactly the, uh, the, the, I mean, each of them can be taken in two directions. So they are exactly the two forms. Uh, yes? mathematical structure of higher intertwiners. Um, yeah. you, s you said in the box center that interactions, yeah, th that we're, we deal with interactions of copies of co-dimension one structures. So in, like in the case of, of SL2 over, over SL3, interactions of copies of, of SU2, right? Yeah. Which, which could be described as usual intertwiners or homomorphisms between normal classical representations. But you said that we, we also deal with interactions between these usual interactors. So yeah, yeah. Would, would these be just again like? Well, I mean, uh, in that right, or? in that model that I was showing, you have n elements. Uh, you have n elements on the base. You see, so on the base you have uh, uh, some intertwiner. Uh, I think there's some problem with it. Yes, uh, on the base you have an intertwiner here. Yes, and then on the faces you have vectors. Or actually if you put an intertwiner in the whole thing, then you have an intertwiner on every face. So it's a relation between uh, n intertwiners, yes? So if you put uh, on this, if you put an intertwiner on each face, uh, on these faces you can put usual intertwiners, yes? And uh, by the way, that would correspond to curving the face, yes, by a lift. And then what you want is to fill it by, uh, I mean, finding uh, curvature, convex curvature in the middle, which matches a given boundary, yes? That would be a higher, an intertwiner between intertwiners. This is interesting because it almost seems like an inverse of the holographic principle where we're, we're working towards getting a convex curvature at the center or in the bulk of the space instead of looking for how information is encoded on the boundary of the space. Yeah, yeah, so, so you, you start from the boundary or you start the other way, you start from anything in the middle and you can get something on the boundary, yes? But what we want now, the big plan, which uh, I had started uh, before these questions, was that we have the higher matrices. So this is uh, the question of art, it was always what's higher representation theory. We have higher matrices, they have higher involutions, and we let them act on vectors. We transform a vector into another vector. That's our representation. That's where we are. So uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you take, and at the base of this, you take an intertwiner, yes? Then you grow it. So you find, that means you find uh, 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 any, uh, anything in the middle which has this as boundary, yes? And we're going to neglect the horizontals, so we may add uh, constants on horizontals. It's easy to prove, exactly. That's what we found, <coughs> because you take the normal uh, surfaces <coughs> and you measure them. But, uh, yes, so, uh, uh, I mean, it takes a bit of work. So if you want to prove it, that means if you don't want to work over SLN, if you want to work over arbitrary base uh, space. So, but let's concentrate on this. So what you have then is out of the base you grow something, yes? And then you act with a higher matrix and you bend that vector into something. So you're going to bend it with tunnels. So next, it remains for next Monday then to define the higher tunnels and, uh, and uh, the way the matrices ask for tunnels. So you can read a matrix unit would tell you build uh, on, on this particular height a tunnel from this face to this face, on the next height a tunnel from this other face to there. So it tells you, uh, so the matrix unit will tell you uh, what tunnels to build at what height, yes? And uh, the fundamental result that we'll prove now is that if you apply that strange transformation that we had on the matrix units, remember the action of the vial group 
SL3, yes? That if you add SL3, I mean, if you act with SL3 on the matrix unit, yes? Then it's the same as turning the, as uh, turning the, uh, uh, the simplex, yes? Or, of course, flipping it if it's re reverse orientation. So, so that, that shows that what we have is really related to, to this representation, yes? And we have some nice, uh, uh, there will be a parity which, anyway, so we'll have tunnels. So, so these will translate a matrix unit into tunnels, like a higher matrix unit into tunnels for every higher dimension. When you say that, that this shows that what we have is really represented, really related to the representation, do you mean that, that, that the, uh, that repre that the tetraegean is a natural representation for these sorts of symmetries? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. I mean, exactly like wires were bent by, in the Gelfand settling here, these uh, higher dimensional vegetables are bent. We're going to concentrate mostly on things of co-dimension one, the blades, yes? But remember that there are inside also things of co-dimension two, co-dimension three, and so on. Yes, for instance, a point in the base grows into a twig, just a line like that, yes? And now a line like that it, it directly would, would directly generalize the uh, a, a uh, differential form, except that you see in the differential form uh, you have you know, the vectors are E1, E2, E3, E4, here, yes? And you you either go in the direction of E1 or E2, yes? Or if, I mean, either you take a one or, 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 I mean, you go to the left. So if you go here to the right, let's say then that, that EI is in your form. If you go to the left, then the EI is in the Hodge dual, yes? Now, if you take a twig, then it's going to go in three directions, exactly the three directions of this pyramid. Yes? If you reverse it. And so you have uh, three directions, so it means that instead of having like a Hodge dual, uh, two things, yes and no, you have three things, so it's, it's a bit like a card game. Yes, in which uh, three people or more are playing, and you can uh, you can put assign each level, so each EI is for one of the one of the players. Yes, and uh, so you have uh, uh, you know E five is in the second set or in the first set or second set or something. Yes, so you have uh, it's like a hodge hodge with uh, with uh, uh, several sets. Triality almost is yeah, like horse triality. Uh, but however, if we'll show that if you uh, work with a uh, uh, with a co-dimension one blade, the same. You start from this point, then what you have at the bottom is a blade, exactly one of the generator blades. Like for instance, here a letter Y. Yes, and you can show one can show with a, a little bit of work, not too much, that uh, something like that grows into what we'll call a fir tree. So it keeps exactly the same shape of the letter Ys, but the center goes in any arbitrary direction. So it's the same, but it has blades in these three directions, for instance here. So if it starts with the letter Y in one direction, it keeps the letter Y in that direction up to the end, yes? So that's a fir tree. So it's a it's a it's a trunk, but with a letter, with a with a uh, uh, and then that that thing on the base corresponds to a cyclic orientation of the vertices. You see, you have two letter y's because they correspond to one direction or the other. In general, it's a cyclic ordering of the vertices, and we we'll show how. Uh, so we have this fir tree. It really looks like a fir tree. And uh, yes, ah, the nice uh, theory of the microphone, by the way, is that uh, that's why the mic, no, it, it needs to yeah, be yeah. turned on. But the mic, uh, actually, in order to work, you really have to hold right, it. Right. Yes, yes. So the tunnels, we define them here, right? So over, a, we define, we've got pictures for SL3, so it's exactly. Yes. Here. So they define it here, so over a brain, what's in the base? Is it just the most degenerate blade? Is that? Yeah, here is just a degenerate blade, exactly. The most degenerate blade 
is simply separating the coordinates in two. And the whole philosophy here is that we look at the high, I mean SL2 over anything, and we reproduce the same, we try to reproduce the same for SLK over SLN. You understand? In the usual case, you see that was the insight of uh, Gelfand and Settlin, really. Uh, namely that uh, if you look at the action of SL2, yes? So in my language, that's bending a wire. Yes? Then you can uh, make a big pyramid and you can let EI I plus one act by bending a wire. So exactly like in SL2, yes? So that's what you want. You want to reproduce SL2 all over. So SL2 is a tip, but you can reproduce SL2 all over. Yes, so that's uh, that's uh, method that we're going to use. So for this involvement you can have the I large power and does that increase the, the magnitude? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you divide them into N uh, cards. So it's like a game. Actually, if you divide it into four, yes, then uh, then it's really like a nice card game because you have a pack of cards divided into four, yes. And it will turn out you have also a cyclic order, so they are arranged around the table, yes? And all these card in all these card games, you can give uh, something to, to, to the, the next fellow at your right, for instance, yes? So take something from your left, give it to the right. Yes, so there are games of this kind. Maybe you can uh, help with uh, reference. And uh, so that's what we have. We have a cyclic order of the base, yes? So that's what we'll do next time. So we'll show how the tunnels act. Now the tunnels separate, as we said, the coordinates into two subsets, yes? Right? But that's exactly our distinguished hyperplane. Remember, our distinguished hyperplane is exactly something like x1 plus x3 plus x4 is equal to an integer, yes? Uh, and the complement is also equal to an integer. So they come from separating this, yes? So here, for instance, the special planes are either parallel to the base, uh, to the outside, or they're parallel to these. Do you see you separate the coordinates like that? We take a section and it's a rectangle, yes? So these are the special hyperplanes. So this explains actually why we have the, these higher special hyperplanes on which our whole geometry is based. The reason is that they exactly simulate, they exactly represent the uh, case of SL2, the simplest one. Yes, so in the case of SL2, you can, uh, which looks like this, yes, you have exactly these two kinds of blades. You see one and two, the square, yes? And these are the special hyperplanes, so everything in, uh, if you work in 3D, everything is built exactly out of these special hyperplanes, yes? Our whole geometry is based on these special hyperplanes, yes, and the affine roots, so that's all. And these special hyperplanes are just a, a, a generalization of I and trying to use them for this geometry? Yeah, yeah, so they come from an affine system, and you, you take an affine system like this, do you see around the red point, there are four affine lines, and you take subsets of uh, co-dimension two, which means here you take pairs, pairs of a fine uh, roots. Yes, and they can be either pairs, you see like this at 120 degrees or pairs at 90 degrees, yes? And so you build squares and hexagons. Uh, that's the geometry of the whole thing. So it's, it's uh, extremely simple, but it's also motivated fundamentally by the fact that you reproduce SL2. So you produce what happens in a pyramid. Yes, and uh, uh, as to the interpretation, I mean, that's, that's still in the works. So uh, the idea here was to give also some seminars, some research seminars in the, uh, after January, so I'm going to invite everybody from time to time. So, so some of the things are still computed, but it's very clear that there is that network. Actually, I started with that network. In the picture that was put on our website, uh, I hold in the hand, I'm jumping, uh, I mean, I'm gravity zero. So one book, which unfortunately I held the wrong way, is a book on gravity, because I had seen the curvature. And the other, uh, on the other hand, is exactly a model with pieces of this, 
of this uh, thing, yes? Which has on the boundary exactly intertwined as of, uh, uh, I mean, it has a 6J symbol. So it's a inside, it's a middle if you want of some 6J symbol. So this was uh, about uh, 11 years ago or so. So uh, I, we should stop here because, uh, yes, otherwise we could continue to talk. Uh, we have three more sessions next week and uh, of an hour and a half. And uh, so we should be able to finish. There are some nice formulae and uh, theorems. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, so I'll be here at 11 and then. So we don't know. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So if it's not, then we can move it to uh, Arthur's office or some small hall. Maybe Barbara can fi can help us figure out. We don't know whether we have uh, uh, the amphitheater or some other room three. There, it's uh, there will be nothing here. It's been done already. Thank you very much for the recording. <laughs>